And welcome to episode 61 of the Sales Syndicate podcast. You may recognize the uh, two people on your screen. If you're not watching, um, then we've got our current top performing podcast guests oh. back on. Oh, he's Ego blushing. is the enemy. Is, Ego yeah. is the enemy, Jamie. <laughs> now, um, applause in my head. I will be transparent and say that Jack prompted me to kick off the episode <laughs> with that. I just, so. I just thought if no one's listened Tick. before and they're thinking, why are these guys so arrogant? Why do they think they know what they're talking about? <laughs> you were hyping us up before the show and that this is where we're at now. Yeah, they're, okay. they're data-backed top performers. So now, now you, that, that's got to go on the LinkedIn. Data-backed top performers. Yeah, top performing podcast guest speakers. That's, 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 that's a Too justifiable kind. claim. You will not get sued if you claim that. Um, but anyway, aside from um, talking about Jack and Zach for an hour, we're going to be uh, chatting about questions to keep your prospects on a call. Um, before we get going, I think Jack and Zach, for those who don't know who you are, give yourself a bit of an introduction in the company as well as, as to why you're the right people to talk to uh, about questions to keep your prospects on a call. I'd Jack? probably tell people that we're the wrong people to talk to, and I'd probably try and talk them out of it. Um, in in a nutshell, me and Zach are best friends since childhood. We run a company together called We Have a Meeting, brackets WAM, um, and we specialize in getting you in front of your ideal prospects at the right time. So typically welcomed in by companies who don't know how to work a telephone or hide behind LinkedIn automation or email automation. Those things do exist. There are companies out there that do that. Um, but we specialize in picking up the phone, using psychology and chimp disarming tactics to have genuine conversations in the style of a therapist. I tried to ram it all down into 30 seconds. No, I liked it. I liked it. Yeah. Zach Thompson, anything, anything you want to ram in? How could I add anything? Sorry? <laughs> Excuse me? <laughs> Say? Get a bit carry on. No, nothing from me. You summed it up perfectly. The check's in the post. Oh, my God. Lovely. There we go. That's what we do. There you go. Jack, do you want to uh, just carry it on from here? Zach can just... <laughs> Back, back no. off the call, keep, keep, the, keep things more no, streamlined. What, what I say to people is, you come to Jack for the com. He's a comic. I'm a classic. Yeah, that's the difference. <laughs> like Casablanca meets Big Daddy, that kind of vibe. Exactly. Yeah, it like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, something like that. Well, okay. And um, I, this episode is not going to go out until after uh, Podcast and Pints, which is an event we will have hosted for the first year anniversary. Um, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna, that's what I'm expecting now. I'm expecting Casablanca and uh, Big Daddy. I'm expecting comedy and classic humor and classic mm. on the night. So, so what, what, what are you guys gonna wear then? If one of you's classic and one of you's humor and comedy, what, are, what are you thinking of wearing? If he's a aside comic, from the t-shirts, which you are legally obliged <laughs> to wear, of course. Well, it's funny you say that. I'm gonna wear a t-shirt that I'm legally obliged to wear, mm -hmm. and um, Jack's gonna wear. You're gonna wear that. That moustache that you wear sometimes I've, when we're in Since 2009, I'm legally obliged to wear underwear when I go out in public now as well. So I will <laughs> oh, be wearing the fly that. accident. Fly yeah, yeah, the fly. Don't they, so keep yours closed. Yeah. You know what they say? Closed mouth opens, no flies. <laughs> the imagination is running wild. <laughs> but the, um, the top forming episode that we spoke about at the start was unconventional cold call openings. And I think we were... We wanted to get you back on one because we wanted to to rinse your popularity um to be transparent um but two we we thought it was it just seemed logical to get you back on and talk about the next part of the cold call process almost like so you've opened the cold call and now it's about keeping people engaged so we've come up with like five categories of questions if you can call them that um and i think we'll just run through a few of your favorite ones that work well for you um this year last year whatever um, and hopefully people can go away and take some of these questions and, and try them out on the phone. Um, I think there was a, quite an interesting pattern interrupt that we went um, over on the last episode that, that went down very well on, on LinkedIn. We were running that on the ads and that's, uh, that's gone down very, very well. So fingers crossed we get some, some gems. Um, the first one we're going to go through is interesting questions and pattern in, in, interrupt questions we, if, to be to be open when i said uh, that was category number one um zach did say well, what what do you mean by interesting questions and jack forgot what he meant by that but well, we, that, we, that, we, isn't that yeah that is an interesting question in itself what yeah. is an interesting question that is quite a 
thought provoking questions out. So well done for sticking to the brain. Thankfully for those listening, we did figure out what they meant by that. So pattern interrupt, interesting questions. Well, give us some of your um, go tos, your favourites to keep people on a call. Well, you have to be brave to use these, right? So sometimes when you're on a discovery call or you're in a cold call or you're on a demo or negotiation call, there's a feeling, you feel it in your soul. This guy isn't paying attention to me anymore. And I can see it in his eyes. He's glossed over. And COVID and working from home presents interesting scenarios where you'll be sat in a room, a guy's got his big bookshelf behind him. He's trying to show you, look how intelligent I am. And as he looks on interest, I'll suddenly stop myself and say, Jamie, how many of them books have you read? What? Suddenly, ears prick up again, because I've just hijacked your amygdala. I've just said, whoa, whoa, pay attention. This isn't going the way you think it was going. Me and Jack were on a discovery call once, and a guy did the same thing, started looking uninterested. I just went, how tall are you before we go any further? And he was like, what? Just to make sure you're sharp and you're paying attention. So that's one example. The other example is how do you use interesting questions to challenge people? So sometimes you'll be on a call and people will paint the worst picture of their business and their job that you've ever heard. It's hopeless. My team are hopeless. The infrastructure invested in is hopeless. The software is hopeless. The question that we all want to ask, but are often scared to, and the most interesting one of all is, Jack, could I ask you a really direct question without you wanting to punch me in the face? Yeah, go on then. Are you sure? Because I'm, I'm a bit worried about asking it. Yeah, go on. I'm ready for it. Why don't you just quit? It's a beautiful question. Why don't Sometimes, you just quit? Jamie, people will say, oh, I'm going to. I'm actually going to quit. Yeah, I can't do anything about it. So that's one angle, right? We've disqualified someone. The other angle is they will then jump in to talk about all the reasons why they need to fix the problem. Why? No, now's the right time. I've got the money. I've got the investment. I'm backed. And then we're in. So we're doing a good job by asking that challenging question of doing our job as salespeople, qualifying or disqualifying. Jack, any of your favorites mm. you want to throw in, big boy? <laughs> I, would, I would say when it comes to interesting questions, so you, you are right that you, you can sometimes sense, like if, you, if it is on a discovery call, you can sometimes sense that you're losing track of somebody, like, and you can see it. I was on a discovery call a few weeks ago and I, I don't know where this prospect had come from. If, if he's listened to this and oh, well, it was smoking a fag on a call. He was just sat there smoking a fag and then like clicking for Excel sheets in the background, just like, just like typing away. Like it was proper ASMR for like, you know what I mean? Keyboard warrior kind of stuff, if that's what you're into. Um, and I knew that I need to hijack him. I knew that I had to like stop him and, and get the conversation going again. Um, so I said, I've got to ask you a, a really weird question. And all of a sudden the ears prick up, but he's not really in the moment. I said, okay. He went, yeah, yeah, go on. I said, right. I want you to imagine I'm a five-year-old. Okay. And I'm wearing a little red hat. And I'm wearing a, a pair of blue dungarees and I've got a little ice cream in my hand. Bang, straight away. You're painting a picture and someone's like, what the hell is going on? And I go, okay. Now you've got that image in your head. If I was that five-year-old, how do you describe the problem that you solve? So I'm taking it to a different narrative. I'm trying to get somebody to simplify it because if someone keeps giving you the same answers and you're like, dumb it down, water it down, give it me in a, a less complex way, it can maybe sometimes get a bit feisty, but using that as a bit of a pattern interrupt and asking it in a weird way, all of a sudden it's like, why is this guy telling me to imagine him as a five-year-old? And when you ask things like, can I ask you a weird question? Can I ask you a direct question? All of a sudden, the tension and the anxiety and the blood starts rushing from your feet to your head. You start thinking, oh, my God, what is he going to ask me? Is he going to ask me what bra size my wife wears? And then when you say something weird or something that's not as intense, it's like, phew, sigh of relief. So you're, you're trying to break them or get them out of that autopilot mode and just disarm them from that innate barrier that they put up when they're having a sales conversation. Mm, absolutely. And and we had some guys on our podcast recently and it's all like chimp and it's all psychology. And, and you've got to remember that most of the time you're having a conversation with the chimp part of the brain and the chimp part of the brain is there to, to keep them safe and, and to make them survive and things like that. 
So your job is to kind of stun them and use those different pattern interrupts. And the way to disarm the chimp, there's three ways, humor, honesty, and allowing them room to say no. So if you can think of questions that are humorous, honest, and also give them an opportunity to say no, then you, you're, you're kind of moving in the right direction. The, the big reason that we kind of wanted to focus on questions for this podcast is if you listen to most salespeople, I'm not talking about all, but most sales calls, I had, I had a cold call this morning and it was just like, um, we specialize in B2B, something, that was after, I don't think they did their research, but we specialize in B2B marketing and we can give you a list of all the clients that are currently looking. Would you like a free copy of that? That's your question. You might have one question on a sales call and that's it. Do you, want, do you want a free copy of this? It's shit. And most salespeople think about themselves and how can I get all of my features and benefits out in 30 seconds? No, ask a thought-provoking question about that person, their world, their problems, and see how the conversation flows. So you know, when I finished the, um, the chimp paradox, I, di I didn't really enjoy it as much as I thought I would because of all of the carrots and planets and computers and things that they, what he metaphorically uses. Yeah, just all these like random things that he uses but i tell you what my driving has got a lot more relaxed let's say so when <laughs> someone does something that they shouldn't do i now give my give myself a second to be angry and then i self and i so i ask myself is there any point in me getting angry at this person mm. and that i can thank the chimp paradox for and i think that's the sort of the same thing of like you're asking someone a question that they that passes into the computer part portion of their brain of I need to process this question because that was I wasn't expecting that and then because they processed it they've given themselves time to pause and open up and then be like right now my computer's taking over not my chimp and I mm. think um yeah I get what I, I get what you were uh, get what you were saying about the um disarming the chimp there for those that have absolutely no idea what he's on about with chimps and computers yeah sometimes there's a a, a, a wonderful thing that happens where like if you imagine what you about the, the chimp brain think you, you can think of it as the emotional brain and the logical brain as well so you've got ancestral emotional brain looking after keeping you alive and you've got logical brain which is more like where human beings are today but you notice the best sales calls start to be a bit of a war between those two parts of the brain and how you know you're doing it and you're achieving that is we go from like a lucid conversation like we're having now so it starts to slow down and the person's going oh Mm, good good question i'd have to think about that for a minute and then i start to egg it on even more and say you sound quite conflicted actually no 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 no. i'm not conflicted no no i know i know that i think it's just that uh, um and that's when you know there's that ping pong happening between the two parts of the brain that's interesting i think in in terms of um interesting questions do you would you advocate for questions that are that you would guess are pot potentially interesting to that person. So not interesting in the sense of random, but interesting as in if they've got books in the background, you say, what's your favorite book? No, no. Or is it, or is it just too, is it, is it, is it too down the middle, too straight line, down the straight line? You go, what we're t the pattern interrupt questions that we're using are just to get someone's that other part of the brain back involved in the call back detect so it's not just in like uh, autopilot mode of like oh, i'm in a sales call like let's do it. it's just to get the awareness back the interesting questions should be around challenging someone's beliefs or notion on things so an example might be i've been working on this one recently we're always trying to add new things in to get more efficient but a challenging one might be someone might say you know, I've used agencies like yours before, and actually it doesn't work because people don't understand what we do very well and the meetings that we get aren't the right quality. Now, the average salesperson to that would then start like, let me get my USP machine gun out and start absolutely trying to just drive home why we're so good. Instead, I've just started saying, well, makes sense. Imagine you were in the opposite side and you'd had a good experience. What would the alternative argument be to what you've just said? And then they make the own, their counter argument on your behalf. So it's almost like saying like, okay, now make the other argument rather than me making the argument for them. So interesting question, just how do I get someone in that zone where they're thinking a bit more, challenging themselves or challenging that belief that they've brought to the table? Uh, you, you mentioned um, the word challenging um, a few times there. So if we were going to focus on challenging or like those difficult questions i think you gave us one of um you know should you quit 
that's yeah. obviously a, a that's at one end of the scale what what else would you sort of um categorize put into that category of like difficult challenging questions that you could ask um, I'd, one... I'd say Sorry, Jack, I would, well we're probably going to say the same one i reckon and if we don't say the same one now then maybe we should stop the podcast uh one <laughs> of the big one is when it's like a, a manual or a people problem and then it's a case of okay can i take it down a direct question route why, why don't you just sack them all why don't you get rid of them let's check in with that was that the question no, it wasn't, no. but I like it. Right. We don't have to hey, 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 it's, hey. it's, it's twice as much content. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I'd go, I'd go that, that that's a route of kind of like, why don't you just de- definitely like lean on the why questions can be confrontational at times. So it's about finding the best opportunity to use those why questions that are going to get them thinking and really get them open up. So why don't you just sack them all? Why don't you just quit? Go on, Zach. I'm keen to hear you yours now. Then. What, why didn't you just quit? No, no, you didn't really. <laughs> first, didn't you? So another one is often when you've had like a quite an emotional conversation with someone, the biggest objection you've got, and it's often unsaid, is change. People tend to be reluctant to change. Human beings have been great at evolving to adapt to problems rather than fix them. That's like our whole, whole evolution is just we adapt to problems rather than like find the immediate solution to them. So that's your biggest objection. But often people don't say, nah, the reason I'm not going to do this is I don't want to change. It's like an unsaid one. So what we always ask at the end of a really good, juicy, emotional sales call is, look, you've done all these different things and it does sound like it's a painful process. Do you mind if I ask you a bit of a direct question? I'm like, yeah, 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 go on. Have you given up on fixing this? Now, Two things are going to happen. Yes, I have. Fine. Removed, disqualified. I've done my job. Or they'll jump in and say, not only, no, I've not given up on it, but all the reasons why they haven't. And it's that same thing of, why don't you just quit? It's the exact same thing. Have you given up on fixing this? No, 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 not at all. And I'll tell you exactly why. They don't just stop at no. They say, no, 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 I'll tell you exactly why I haven't as well in the next 10 minute monologue. And then at the end of that, all this like, salesy crap of can i steal 10 minutes in your diary someone's just told you all the reasons why they've not given up all you have to say at the end of that is well, have you got your diary there that's it if you've told me the reason why you want to fix it and why you've not given up it's up to you you got your diary there and i guess this sort of plays into that weird well not weird it's completely normal it's a human defense mechanism of i have to um someone's come on the offensive here by asking me a question that i don't like to to hear because they're they, they're saying that I have quit. So they, mm. they're going on the defensive, which means they almost go too far the other way, like you said, and just give you all the information that they didn't want to give you because it's a sales call. Yeah, exactly. Exactly that. And that's the, it's hard. If you were proactively really trying to persuade someone, I mean, chat with some of this the other way, if I just approached them in the street and started trying to persuade them out of nowhere to buy something that I had in my rucksack or something, it's almost impossible to do that so i don't know why people think you can just ring strangers up and persuade them in that way it's not how human beings work it's almost by doing the opposite that they'll talk themselves into things now would you usually leave these questions to as as like a last resort or do you mix it up do you drop them in early on if you feel like it's a lost call already or I, i always finish on emotion before a close so an emotional question like a challenging question emotional question before we go for a close and a close for us is pretty soft it's like i'm saying they haven't got your diary there is a typical close for us and then after that i'm then going back to logical brain so i've got someone emotional the issue with that is once they calm down from being asked a question like you say where they have to defend themselves there's perhaps a day a week before that meeting i have to get the buy-in from the illogical from the logical brain next so they bought in, they booked the meeting, then I need to ask them some questions that when they come back down from that bit of adrenaline, that justify them showing up to that meeting. So w- what do you think the danger is between now and then, Jamie? Well, I, I, oh, as in you're asking me, right? Yeah, um, yeah I, well, we, we get it. Um, we get it quite, I get it quite a lot of reaching out for the podcast when people are well up for it one day and then two days later, they still haven't booked in and it's... Mm-hmm. You, you know they like they've had a, a chance to process it put it put it through the brain and they're like oh it's quite a lot of work really isn't it oh, do i can't can I be bothered exactly exactly so 
if I'm aware of that, and this kind of goes for any objection as well, if I'm aware of that, I've got a set of last questions that I ask people, but one of them is, can I ask you a weird question before we wrap up? What are the chances that I'll be sat there at half 10 next Tuesday crying into my coffee because you decided to ghost me and you wish you hadn't committed to this? By putting that on the table, no, 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 I'll, I'll be there. I'll be there. I wouldn't waste your time. I'll definitely be there. There's still the anomalies in there. But an interesting thing that happens is people have texted me or emailed me to say, I wouldn't normally do this. But since we put it on the table and you made it clear that I couldn't just not show up, can I reschedule to this day? Or I'm running five minutes late. I wouldn't normally let you know. But since you put it on the table, that's why I'm letting you know. So anything that you feel, I think a good rule for salespeople is to just put it on the table. And people, people think that buyer's remorse only exists when, when you're actually paying for something. A buyer's remorse can exist with anything. Like if you get to the end of that call and you thought it was going to be something else and you've given your time, then you're going to regret that. So it's just laying out those expectations and getting that next step in. And that, that's why like every sales call that, that we do, that last question, and, and even following on from there, okay, so we sit down for a, a discovery call, Jamie, and you're like, brilliant, I want to move ahead, but I need to work out when's going to be the right time. Okay, well, what should I do next? Well, send, that, send over the, the builder or whatever it is. Okay, and, and then what would you like me to do? It's, it's putting it all on you, but I'm, I'm, I'm letting you have the con control of it and, and having those mini contracts, whereas all of the Grant Cardone and all, all of that stuff is like, no, you ABC, always be closing, force your next steps onto them. It's like, well, it's a prospect. It's their world. It should be a case of what do they want to do and how do we do it at their pace? And when you allow people the room to say no, like we said earlier, they're more likely to say yes. Yeah, we've had quite a few um, people on the podcast talking about the the sort of time of buyer enablement that we're in now. And it's it's not necessarily about sales development from a internal process point of view and how you can optimize that. It's about how you can optimize the, the buying journey for your prospects. So I think that's, yeah, it's quite an interesting one of actually um, challenging them to give you a to-do list of what they need from you or what, what they want from the, from the process. That's an interesting one. Hmm. In terms of um, you, t you touched on it, like, a bit at the start, thought provoking questions. And I guess, to be honest, most of these questions that we're going through are going to be thought provoking, but are there any um, questions that you would tend to ask or aim to ask that would make someone pause and actually really, really think about, think about the answer rather than it just being a, um, a you know, an obvious one for them? It depends mm, on the personality that you're, dealing with sorry chat we keep doing that don't we we've we both just got a lot to say finish each other's you're not, you're not sandwiches. sandwiches you're not the uh, number one <laughs> go on <laughs> um yeah so it, because it depends on who you're dealing with right we deal with a lot of ceos self-made millionaires growing their businesses you have to challenge these people in a, a way that they've got an ego and i don't mean that in a bad way we've all got an ego it might be an ego that's designed to protect them and they start this business looking for validation and often they're painting a picture to you of where they want their business to be in the future so sometimes i will challenge the little six-year-old in their head that wasn't loved enough with questions like um this business goal that you're working towards are you chasing an image of jamie in his big house and his flash car or are you chasing a feeling i.e when I feel fulfilled, that's the goals that I should have hit. And people always sit back in the chair and go, oh, I don't know. The little child in the head is wondering, is it about me living in the big house makes me happy? Or is it, I'll be happy when I live in the big house? And they're both so very... Potentially more psychological or um, philanthropic, I don't know, philosophic questions. Yeah, exactly. We started throwing in a lot of... Um, like therapy style stuff. So we, we almost, there's three sales books we really like. And then we almost threw those out once we've got them really good. They're sat in the office, but we've picked up on what do therapists ask on calls. So if a therap if a salesperson was sat down with an alcoholic, talking them out of being an alcoholic, they'd start telling them, you shouldn't be an alcoholic. Here's all the good things about being sober. Let me tell you all the features, advantages and benefits. So therapist, sorry, just 
just to clarify, a, a salesperson helping someone not become yeah. an alcoholic. If they that, that use seems... the same skills. Yeah. Oh, if they use... say that, <laughs> Here's a college. You'd be talking to a mirror. <laughs> <laughs> if they use the same skills by the notion of what the skill set is, that would be the way to do it, right? But a therapist would say, what does it do for you in an alcoholic? What do you like about it? And those are the questions that are much more thought provoking than how great would life be if you weren't an alcoholic? Well, I know that, you know, my family's left me and stuff like that. They, they, they know why, but again, it's not the way thought provoking questions work. So we're always trying to challenge things like what the status quo is, like I said before, not changing, talking to like inner child, those types of questions as well, because they tend to get people to sit back a minute and think, wow, okay, I've not been asked that before. Jack, any you dad? Mm. No, it, it it leads on nicely from the the therapy style questions, and I and I think the it would if this podcast is about good questions, it's probably worth taking a minute to look at shit questions. And me and Zach were talking about this earlier, but like questions like, what impact did that have on you? And if you achieved X, how would that make you feel? They're like X factor questions. If you've got a record label, how would you feel? Oh, it's my dream. It would be the biggest thing in the world. Like what impact? That's not the language that, that, that you would typically use. So when we've had therapists on, on the, our podcast, I think one of the big ones was why now? So what has happened recently? Nobody just goes onto the, like nobody falls onto the internet and goes, oh my God, I've just bought car insurance. How did I do that? Or, yeah. or I've just booked a holiday. There's a process of, of everything that's happening and something's triggered it. And then, then that's kind of led to a decision or an emotional response. What is it? Nobody just falls into a cake shop and yeah. walks out with 12 apple pies. Yeah. There's like something that's happened along the way. It's, it's so happened it's, to us all. <laughs> yeah, I know. Speaking from experience, but like the, so why now is, is one of our therapeutic questions that we like. And then probably a follow on from that is like, if we are talking about problems, what, when was, when was the first time you realized that was a problem? And then, and then we're kind of getting into that situation where they're giving examples and we're, we're kind of um, working towards that heuristic bias where the more examples they give us, the more kind of convinced they are and they paint a bigger picture in their head. And what, and, and that's the big thing. That's why like, when we think about sales, it's just a, a handful of different psychology and narratives and biases. And your job is just there to poke the monkey and get them to think outside of the box and, think actually am i thinking this because of my bias against salespeople, or is this actually a belief and a fact so it's like it's just challenging all those belief systems yeah i hadn't really um thought about it from a therapy style questions point of view I, you say you've had um sort of therapists on did you have them on purely to talk about how to get people to open up like what what was, what was the topic of conversation when you had them on me yeah, I'm, um, I'm not doing it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we're always the, the the way people solve problems. If you think of it, a, a therapist will take someone on a, the same route. You're trying to solve a problem, but solve it yourself. So a therapist, if you think of, if I went down like with my wife, not that I need to, she's listening. But if I went to like couples therapy with my wife, I wouldn't walk in the door and they go, you know what you need, our platinum package. Our platinum package will, will sort this right out. They'd take some time to get to know you, but they would never do it from a place of judgment. It would be from a place of tell me more about that. When you say that, what do you mean? That was interesting. Pad that point out a bit more. Go a little bit deeper on what you said there. Why do you think that is? And they're going to get you to make the conclusion yourself by steering you through lots and lots of well-placed questions and also little challenges of language. So we're big on, if you're on a discovery call, if you start to notice someone's using a lot of I think, we might, I'm not sure, those type, or maybe that type of language at the start of all their sentences, it's not unusual and it's almost encouraged in our approach to say, do you mind if I stop you? I've just written this down here. At the start of everything that you're saying, you're saying, I think. Normally when people are sure, they don't say, I think. So um, what's, what's happening? Well, I don't know, you know, we're on the fence and then they start to pad that out. Or they say, you, no, 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 I, I know. I know, and then they change the language the rest of the call. And then that starts to be a story that they tell themselves. I think I might do something. If you're telling yourself that story internally, you'll do it at some point. I know I need to do something. If we can get someone there and challenge the language and the story they're telling themselves, we're going to get a lot further. The salesperson should 
the analogy I like to think of is the salesperson isn't there to just be this like mach- Glen Gary, Glen Ross machine, like trying to get money out of someone, shaking them until coins fall out of their pocket. It is that therapeutic, therapeutic style of I'm a lazy river. You're going to give me bits of information. I'm just going to nudge you along and point you in the right direction and question different things. You say, why that? Why that? And then eventually you've done a full circle and you're back and then you're getting your credit card out. That's kind of the style i think <laughs> uh, before i forget to ask it you spoke about three books um that you love uh, that are in the office um what what were the three books what are the three books so, sale there's different books i could recommend but from a purely sales perspective if you're looking for what three sales books should i be uh looking at there's never split the difference chris voss book good for negotiation i like that book because you can practice the stuff on it on your friends and family and it not have to get them to be a salesperson. There's human communication skills in there. Uh, gap selling. I'd probably get it on audio book if you can, because it's by a very passionate American man. He'll bollock you on a dog walk and you'll feel like I need to go and deliver something tomorrow. And then the, probably one of the most important, like if you could start anywhere, you can't teach a kid to ride a bike at a seminar, which is a Sandler book, but it really sums up a lot of this style and not only sums it up but the why it's important which i think is so important in any of these books any methodology should be able to tell you why to do something not just do something now the next one we've got on the um the list is the the one last question rule so who wants to uh who wants to kick us off there you want to go you want me to go you want me to go you, you want to go for it you want to change Wait, I'll, 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 I'll adjudicate jack it's your turn Oh, it's my turn. Yeah. Oh, Zach oh, oh no, Zach, Zach, Zach's just one. I'll tag him in, I'll tag him in when I get bored. Um, All right. One last question. Okay, so specifically when, when, when we're cold calling, as you can imagine, there'll, there'll be points where people say, oh, I'm not interested. Oh, I'm actually already sorted. I'm already working with the provider. I can't take a, a sales call right now. And then there's many different things you can do. Obviously, you, you do as much as you can in the front end. But the one last question is basically, as a salesperson, metaphorically, walking yourself to the door. And then when you're at the door with one foot out and the door open, you kind of lean him back in and say, listen, but before I go, can I ask one last question? And, and nine times out of 10 people are like, go on then. And that is your one last attempt to ask something. If it is a piece of thread or a piece of cloth to see if there's anything that you could do to kind of tear it open a little bit. So you've got one big question to ask them that can kind of get them talking and actually see if the objection is just a a smoke screen or if there is genuinely a problem or if there's something a bit more to it. Or you might even use it in a situation to be like, you know what, this guy's got absolutely no problem. I I can tell it's perfect. but I might use it as an opportunity for a referral. So one example might be if someone says, I'm not interested, like, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Of course, I, I, I assumed. So you always accept it. Yeah, of course. Um, I thought that I thought that you wouldn't be interested. Obviously, you're a busy man. Hey, be- before I go, Jamie, can I ask you one last question? And you go, yeah. And say, when you say you're not interested, is it you're not interested because you're already working with another sales agency? Or are you you're not interested because you've had some mockney cold call you at two o'clock on a Tuesday? And it's the the illusion of choice as well there. And and there are many different things that you can fill into the, are you not interested? Because people love choices. If I say, what's your favorite ice cream? You go, I mean, knowing you, you'd probably be able to like, yeah, it's mint choc chip off the bat. But do you you know what? When I was a kid, it was mint choc chip. But now it's uh, probably rum and raisin. How did I do that? That That is a viral clip. <laughs> I know my rum and raisin, guys. You, you yeah, creep not... me out a little bit. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> yeah. Get that on TikTok. Um, <laughs> but yeah, but it's, 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 if I ask you, you're going um, thinking, oh, I don't know what my favorite ice cream If I said, do you like chocolate or vanilla? Your mind just chooses straight away. Um, Zach, anything to add on that? What are your favorite one last questions? I like the uh, ones where people tap out a lot is I have a team that covers that as an objection. Oh, I've already got a team in place that covers that. Yeah, thought you would. A lot of the businesses in the space do. <clears throat> do you mind if I ask you one last question before I let you go? Yeah, yeah, go on. When you went to your team and you said, what's one area that we're really struggling in at the minute where we can help? What did they tell you? 
Now, again, two roots. I love these ones where, they, where it's two roots. If he says, I've never asked them that question before, or she, or they, painting themselves out to be a bad leader, right? So that isn't a root. You can't say, oh, I've never asked them that question without looking like a bit of a twat. So you say, oh, well, we're struggling with X, and then we're back in. Okay, so those are two routes there. Another one I like is if someone's already got something in place that's like maybe like a software or something like that that you sell him. Yeah, I thought you would. A lot of people already got something in place. Do you mind if I ask you one last question? Yeah. What would need to happen to make you consider something else? And then they're going to paint a picture of, well, if something was cheaper, faster, better, whatever it may be, they're probably going to give you just a little bit of something. And it might be that it's nothing. It might be that it's just like a, I've got to call them back when a renewal's there but at least I've got something to call them back on rather than just adding them to the CRM call back in six months, totally blind. So those are the ones that I really like. The other thing you can do with a one last question is if you are going to have to call someone back in a sea of salespeople, you need to make sure that you're memorable. Okay. So we talked about the swans one last time, didn't we, Jamie? You like that one? We did talk about the swans one. Yeah, I did enjoy that one. Okay. So I'm, I'm disappointed interview- though you didn't kick off this podcast with. Uh, so uh, have you thought about them swans? Yeah, because you keep <laughs> sending me pictures of swans at three o'clock in the morning, saying you up, hun. <laughs> That's why <laughs> you up, duck. <laughs> <laughs> What's up, duck? Um, so <laughs> if you're looking to be memorable in a sea of lots of other salespeople, a great one last question, or sit. Maybe Jack can throw some in here as well. Yeah, we've already got a software uh, in place. We'll be looking to assess options probably in about nine months. Yeah, makes sense. Do you mind if I ask you one last question? Yeah, yeah, go on. If you had to write a song about the software that you've already got, what would you call it and why? What? And then they're going to probably give you some sort of strange answer or strange spiel when they've thought about it. That goes in the CRM. Then when I call back in nine months, that's what I use to be memorable in the sea of lots of other salespeople. Any weird ones from you, Jack? Uh, we we that, that's one of my favourite ones, the one that you were saying there. That there's it's it's and that's where your pattern and we probably come full circle to like your interesting questions, but that's where you could just throw something in and you've got to make it relatable. And I think the the best salespeople are the ones that have that like je ne sais quoi where they can just like think of it on the spot and they can just ask something a little bit interesting or something a little bit weird and it, it is it teachable? It's a debate that me and Zach have had many times, but you can, you can kind of, you can work on it. It definitely is a muscle that you can kind of strengthen. So just like making sure that you don't leave that. Okay. Um, when, when I call you back, what are the chances that you're going to remember the sales call? And then like getting something weird or wonderful in there. So there's mm-hmm. many ways of, of doing that. I've always, I was talking about this on a, a recent podcast last week, I think. And I said, um, I always think like if you ask a question like what's your favorite vegetable on a first date, you can tell a lot about a person, right? So yeah, I know what you get. Um, <laughs> I'll go, Jack, Jack I, before, we, uh, before I ask you what your favorite vegetables are, do you want to have a guess and see if you can make it three in three? Mint chocolate, chip, your... rum and raisin, and then what's my favorite vegetable, Jack? Go on. Aubergine, winky face. No, come on. Give, give me a serious one because it's definitely not aubergine. <laughs> what, what is your favorite vegetable? Yeah. You're going to say potato or something basic, aren't you? Oh, get out. Potato. That's no. an insult. Pak choy. <laughs> Pak choy. Do you know what? Do you know, Asian is my favourite cuisine, so you're not far off. But no, it's my favourite um, as well, Jamie. Should we get rid of that? We're, we're meant to be. We're meant to go in places. God. <laughs> Dublin's we should go on a trip. We, we should go on a trip on the Orient Express together. That would be life changing. Wow. Someone would die there. They always do. Jack does look a bit like Kim Jong Un, so. Uh, I'll share some photos with you later, Jamie. But go on, what's your favourite vegetable? Uh, asparagus, mate. Oh, asparagus. Yeah. He's a pisser. What's wrong with, what's wrong with an asparagus? What it does to your piss? Yeah. Fry yeah. it. Uh, it doesn't do it to me. Fry That's... it. So, loads uh, of salt. Uh, and pepper. Excuse me. Let's not bypass that. Why doesn't it do it to your piss? What makes you so special? I've obviously got an advanced filtering system. I don't know. Well, I've been said too much. That's, that's, that's <laughs> or it, or it's, or it's, or it stinks so much you just can't pick it up. 
Yeah, wow. that's in your oh. Tinder bio as well. Yeah. <laughs> That's oh, clickbait okay. with this episode, so, isn't it? It sticks it, so much you can't pick it up. <laughs> it's a filtering that. system. <laughs> so uh, if, if asparagus is... N- what are your two guys' favourite veg? If I was going to guess, I'd say one of you's parsnip. I love a parsnip. I, I would have said Jack is a parsnip. I probably would say Zach is a sprouting broccoli. Gosh. Tender stem broccoli. You think we're in a different class than we actually are, I think, Jamie. That's what I'm learning here. <laughs> you see well, us, as, which Jamie. I like. Are you, are you, are yeah. you saying well, that pass... Pass... Are, are you, too yeah. for us. Oh, I do love a tin mushy pea. Yeah, parsnip, when I was growing up, I thought it was a place in Wales. So I don't know if I'm the right person to... <laughs> I think it is as well, actually. It's going on it probably is, yeah. <laughs> yeah it's, it's next door to Clandudno and Abu Dhabi. <laughs> yeah. well, so what are your favourite vegetables? Oh. Jack, I, f- I feel like they're all equal. I like them all. Mushrooms. Oh, God. Mushrooms. What, politician answer. It's all right. Yeah. Isn't it? No, it's not. Come on. Um, what, what is my favourite vegetable? Mm, corn on the cob. Good. Very good. I'm Barbecued. Gonna, I'm going to expose myself here. Would chilies come under vegetables? Do we know for a fact before I say it? Oh, no, it's a fruit because it's got a seed in it. Right, well, not <laughs> that then. And I'm glad you said that because I actually knew the answer to that as well before I said it. <laughs> Probably like sweet potato, maybe? That's a good shout. It's, it's you know, dependable. It's, 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 it's sturdy, but it's got a bit of sweetness to it. Exactly. Mm. If you need, if you mm. have to survive on a vegetable... That's what you should be thinking about. You have to survive on one. Yeah, do you know what? I was watching the, there's a new Netflix thing about living to 100 years. And there's a place in Japan just south of uh, Okinawa, I think, maybe the islands. Um, One of the foods, yeah, the purple Purple. sweet potato, they eat in abundance because it grows there. And that's been clinically proven to help you live longer. So I've never seen a purple sweet potato, but I'd love to, Jamie. Mm, I don't know if you'd. (laughs) Wow. This is we were asking great sales questions and you wanted to no, take no, it down this, this, this is the perfect little example alley about vegetables. This, you know this is the perfect example of, of how a simple, unassuming question can open up the conversation, right? Mm. So people yeah, will remember this podcast you, forever. You're very charismatic as well, Jamie. Also the delivery needs to be discussed. Do you think? Very mm. kind, very kind. Tonality is brilliant. I, I'm Beautiful. surprised you work in marketing with a voice like that and a face like that. You should be, you should be on the front line, man. You should be on top of radio. Soldier. That's what I was waiting for you to say you should be on the front line of radio. I don't like horrible jokes. I like being nice to people. I feel like you need more confidence. Who are you, and what have you done with Jack? <laughs> Corn on the cob. Oh, we've learned a lot. So mint chocolate chip is my childhood. Rum and raisin is my now adult adult ice cream. I love asparagus. Mm. Jack wow. is a um, well mushrooms, bit of bit of everything. You know, corn Very and cob, fantastic. That's what you're getting from it. I just it depends. It depends, right? If you invite me round, <clears> and I tell you my one of my biggest well, Jack would probably disagree with one of my biggest flaws. One of my flaws is if I came round and you like made some like. Monge two, and I ate it. I'd be like, "Oh my god, this is the best Monge two I've ever had. It's great." Went to Brighton once, was like, oh, "I want to live here," and then never went back again. Like, <laughs> I'm very in the moment. Like, I will say, once we leave here, that was God. I love him. He's the best marketing manager. This was the best podcast. And when we do another one on Thursday, Jamie, who? Yeah. Jack's back. Erratic. I'm back in the flow now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Poorly, some might say. He's not well. So I'm gonna now. I'm I'm prepared though now because when you come and join us in Dublin and you're like this, that was the best night of my life. I know you're absolutely full of shit. Oh, but Dublin is different, isn't it? It hits different, doesn't it? Are you from Ireland? Am I from Ireland? I know I'm a redhead, but no, I'm half Scottish, half English. Born in Gloucester. Because my, my sweet potato be Dublin. There it is. <laughs> there it is. Hot line and sinker. Wow. Exactly. Tell um, I don't know if we if I'll upset too many people. We went to Amsterdam many years ago, me and Zach, and we got Which talking to these North, these Northern Irish girls. I got talking you to. Them. That, you couldn't say it. You couldn't say it. 
stop there. You couldn't say it. <laughs> well, now you have to say <laughs> it. No, absolutely could not say it. No, I can't believe okay. you brought that up. How could you say that? How could that be something we can say on a podcast? Well, is, it, is this something that would ruin your marriage relationships no, and no, business? It's, it's, like, it's like really offensive. No, like, it's not, not offensive. No. No, I know where you're trying to... Anyone listening now is thinking what you're trying to make them think. It wasn't that. It wasn't that. Well, go on, Jack. Enlighten us. Yeah, go on, Jack. Save the day. <laughs> no, no. Now I'm panicking. <laughs> <laughs> See, look at that psychological me. play there from Zach. <laughs> And uh, but that's what he does to me on a daily basis. And he's got I all my like shares. That, that, that's, that's a good point to get back to the conversation. Of, okay. of, but, that, no, but that genuinely was a very good example of how we've just spent nigh on 10 minutes talking about vegetables, ice cream, and ne- nearly Amsterdam, which mm. we'll talk about on another podcast. Thank you. Um, but the, the final one that we had on the list was negatively framed questions. So mm. do you want to rock, paper, scissors and see who's going to take that one? Slight delay there, but yeah, Jack's won. Jack's won. <laughs> yeah. um, negatively framed questions, so we're, we're big on going for no. So if somebody has to go for, for a, a negative answer, there's more likely that you're going to get a response. So let me give you an example rather than ramble on. So um, is there any reason, like, like we were talking earlier about like attendance and ghosting and meetings, is there any reason why you wouldn't be able to attend the call? on Friday. Um, is there any reason why we couldn't sit down and explore this further next week? Um, those, those kind of questions like going, going for no in, in those situations where you, t- cause it's very easy to say like, okay, out of the three problems, what is the biggest problem that you've got? And it can feel like someone's grabbing your wallet. Like, Oh, well, I don't, I don't know. It's very salesy. What, what problem do you have? And I'll fix it. Whereas we use a, a negatively framed question of you're probably going to tell me none of those questions exist in your world. And then the defensive mechanism kicks in there and you want to defend it in the same way that we've been talking about all podcasts. No, 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 I wouldn't say that. And then you're in and you're opening it up a little bit. Yeah, I see, yeah. I see what you mean about the negatively framing it now. Because I think when, when, you say, when you say to someone, why wouldn't this, they're, like, they're almost like, well, yeah, actually, why wouldn't it? Why am I being so defensive? Why am I closing them down let's, let's mm. give these boys a chance yeah yeah exactly i like to finish on a on a scale of one to ten how likely is it that i never hear from you again because what they think i'm going to say is on a scale of one to ten, how likely is it that i am going to hear from you again oh how likely is it that i'm never uh and then they have to think about it it's that same thought provoking always make sure people are paying attention not listening but yeah a lot it, of the time it, they're not and they say changing. things like what? I what, asked what? a bloke that the other day, and on a scale of one to ten, how likely am I? Uh, how likely is it that I'll never hear from you again? He went, hmm, at least fifty percent. I don't, <laughs> I don't think you were listening to the to the question there. <laughs> was that <laughs> was that a, was that a work call or a, or a date or what are we talking? Yeah, it was my my other half, <laughs> and I never heard from her since. <laughs> <laughs> so negative yeah. questions. I would say are going to make people feel like they're not under any pressure. That's probably the main factor. You know, if you, if, if I rang you up and I started saying, how would you feel if you had a better deal on your phone? When would you be looking to upgrade? It would start to feel like, oh, there's a hand coming through the phone here trying to grab my wallet. That's the main issue. And we're always thinking of this from like a neuroscience, chemical, like how do I get people to feel comfortable and like they're being nurtured through a conversation rather than dragged through it so if i said i'm guessing if there was a phone contract available that was cheaper than what you're dealing with at the minute and had a bit better reception in hard to reach areas i can see that you're based in x y and z it's probably not going to be something that you're looking at right now because you're in a contract well no hold on a second what what were you saying there about the the because i am based in middle of nowhere so that is an issue that i get okay when you say it's an issue that you get, I'm guessing it's something that you can probably live with. Well, yeah, but it's a pe- and that feels a bit more nurturing than me just like dragging you through and ramming all the features down your throat. But yeah, no, it's it's something I would encourage a lot of people to do. You'll see a, that's like one where you see the immediate difference in in putting questions like that, changing. Them. It's another one of those awkward silences there where I, Jack's like, I can see Jack's sort of ready to say something. But... No, he rocks quite a lot. He's like a he's like an old person <laughs> in palliative care. 
I drink four liters of water a day, so I've constantly got a full bladder, Jamie. So I might look like I'm engaged in the podcast, like but I'm actually just preventing myself from. <laughs> but, but you've actually just wet yourself. I've just pissed. <laughs> wow. Right. Okay. No, well, on the g- g- given that you clearly need a wee, <laughs> we'll uh, we'll finish up with just two two very well three questions. Uh, one for you, Jack. What is your favorite question to keep a prospect on a call of all time? Of all time. Great question, Jamie. Really good question. And the delivery was beautiful. I would say I, I love the scale. So Zach was saying on a scale of one to 10, I love, I love using that in different examples because it's, it, if I was to say, what do you think of your current agency? Yeah, they're good. Like you, you're only ever going to get a positive response. And one of my favorite questions is to be like, okay, well, can I ask a weird question? Yeah. If you had to rate, rate your current agency on a scale of one to 10, what would you currently rate them? Uh, seven, seven. Okay, interesting. Why didn't you say a higher number? Why didn't you choose a higher number? Or it could, or it could work in its favor if it's like a um, some, say they really, really pissed off about something. Oh, a four. Okay, a four. Why, why didn't you say a lower number? And then they say all the things they do like about it and all the positives. Po- positives. Oh well, it does this. They're on time. They blah 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 blah. Okay, that doesn't sound that bad. No, no, it is because. And then they get into defending it and they go over it. That's probably mine. Zach, same question to you. Favorite sales question. Uh, I like uh, why. Favorite now. questions keep them on a call of all time. Uh, I like why now. Simple one. But again, I'm very aware of uh, change as the hidden objection. I was talking about that earlier. So why now challenges that point and gets someone to think of why is this different than all the other times where I looked at this and didn't do anything. It's a why now is a powerful one. Good one to ask to your partner if they lean over and start kissing your neck late at night as well. (laughs) (laughs) Stupid. Which, I mean, (laughs) sounds like a dream, but it it never happens. I don't know why. (laughs) Don't do that. That's not the right response. Why now? I promise you it won't be now if you ask that (laughs) question from previous experience. Um, Jamie, can I ask you a question? Go. Yeah. Yeah. Compared to last time, on a scale of 1 to 10, how much have you enjoyed this podcast? And I've enjoyed it more than the first one because I feel like I know, we know each other a bit better now and I don't feel as much as if I've been bent over with humour and <laughs> yeah, and, and had, basically. Which is why I said uh, the last episode, I stood up and I just went, I was like, I am, I'm sweating here. <laughs> um, so I've enjoyed this one a lot more. I'm more relaxed. Good. I've never been described as bending somebody over with humour. That's a mm. quite a. That's a. That is a compliment. Yeah. It's a nice way of putting that's it. Your, that's your Tinder profile. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll bend you over with humour. Good. Ten. And we never get tens. That's, that's very kind of you. And Don't we like you. Your girlfriend. Wait, you... <laughs> you are very welcome for the ten. And uh, following that, I um, I guess it's just. For me to say thanks for, for joining us. Thanks for taking the time and sharing your wisdom. Um, I'm sure we'll get you back on for another episode. We'll see if we see if this enters the top three or top two, or maybe even beats the last episode, which was Gosh. unconventional cold calls. Obviously, if you haven't heard the unconventional cold calls, you must be a new listener, otherwise you would have. Um, mm-hmm. Go and check it out. Make sure you like, subscribe, all the all the standard stuff. Um, yeah, and we, I guess we, we hope to see you in the next episode. Um, I really want to – keep the reason I keep stuttering is because I want to say we'll see you in Dublin, but this isn't going out until mid-December, I don't think. so. We've seen you in Dublin. Okay. And We've seen you I'm, in Dublin. I'm sorry. I didn't know. And look, it was a mistake. Okay? And I'll, <laughs> I'll sort it out afterwards. The bill's literally I'll, in front of me. Yeah. <laughs> I'll pay the bill. Um, yeah. Jamie, well, thank, you for, for, <laughs> thank you for um, – I, I always enjoy these conversations. Thank you for a, an incredible job. And I guess if you're listening to this, keep keep streaming Jamie. He's great at what he does. So mm. keep listening. It's really good. Well, Very addictive as well. Mm, Moorish. Like, um, Moorish, definitely. Like mm. crack cocaine. Interesting. Just, yeah, I was gonna I'm say hoping Pringles. not as much of a come down as crack cocaine. Mm. Depends how you spell it. No, never mind. And on that note, we will catch you in the next episode. See you there.